Education, data, equity. Reluctant project manager. Gamer, nurse, developer. Job interview today. Alejandra, Maya. <laughs> it it all started uh, back in I guess back in 2023. I had just joined the organization, and I had been a big fan of Maya. And Maya had been working on a series of stories about evictions, and she, she had collected this evictions data for more that was whatever is it, 15 years worth of evictions data or so at the time. And I was coming from. Um, the, what was known at the, at the BGA at the time, and they had just done a story about building code violations. And we had this like wild idea that we started just kind of thinking about what did the data about building code violations said, and what did it say about uh, when we think about evictions, you think about the fact that evictions are a measure of affordability. So what did it say about low-income people? And we wonder what would happen if we combine those two data sets together, if, we, if it was even possible. And that started us essentially in this big journey. Yeah, so the Tenant Trap is a five-part series. And if you've read it already, you know that the first article in the series sort of presents all of our data findings, which is what most of our presentation will be on today. Um, and then we have three stories about different groups of tenants around the city who are trying to uh, get their landlords to do better. And uh, the final story is exploring different solutions and policy proposals out there uh, to try to tackle the imbalance of power between landlords and tenants. So we'll... Um, be going through some of the stuff kind of fast, uh, but we trust that this crowd will have questions if something doesn't make sense. So <laughs> the first step that we needed to take in order to understand if there, like, what, if any, connection is there between uh, building code violations and evictions in the city is we, we started with the city's uh, data portal, uh, which houses the Department of Buildings uh, data on building code violations. So every time an inspector goes out and documents violations at a, at a building, it'll be entered into the data portal, which goes back to 2006. So uh, as we were examining the portal, we uh, essentially narrowed down a few criteria to find buildings that are kind of habitually in disrepair. So there's about 150,000 buildings inside the data portal, like 150,000 buildings that have had any violations against them. But most buildings just kind of show up once in a while or just once and then disappear. We were interested in buildings that had chronic, serious violations. So ultimately, our investigation identified 2,654 buildings in the city that have a serious a, a history of serious um, uh, code violations. And so this is how we were able to narrow this down. Uh, first, the data portal, this is the screenshot of the city's data portal that, that houses all of the building code violation data. Um, the data is kept with a reference to a building's address where the inspector documented the violation. But what we found also is that the DOB has this interesting unique ID called the property group number, which it assigns to every building that's in this portal. And as you know, in Chicago, there's tons of um, courtyard buildings, corner buildings, buildings with like, there could be like tons and tons of different addresses associated with the building, sometimes on two streets. So um, this property group number unifies all the information about one particular building. So this was really key in order to like really talk about not just addresses, but actual buildings. So uh, the second element was, okay, so now we know that there's 150,000 buildings, there are 150,000, about 150,000 unique property group numbers in this database. So then which ones of them have serious violations? Because if it's like, you know, some, some, something that's minor, there's so many different ways that the building code can be violated. We're talking about things that are potential threats to the safety and well-being of tenants in buildings. And uh, we found that there isn't a definition for what a serious violation is currently in the city of Chicago. But back in 2015, the city had created this document for a short-lived program that they had that focused on um, 
trying to like have like a list of problem landlords that they would publish and publicize, kind of like the, there's something called the building scofflaw list that still exists. There was this brief period of time where they had the problem, problem landlord list. And in order to like create this list, the government has to actually issue some criteria for how you wind up on it. And the way you wound up on it is you had to rack up a certain number of uh, s findings of liability for serious code violations. And they had this little appendix, which as you see on the right here, it, there was an appendix in this document that identified which building code violations the city would consider serious. So we went, aha, okay, so this is like, this, th these are things that the city has said before are actual problems. Missing smoke detectors, uh, standing water in basements, exposed wiring, raw sewage, you know, that's like spilling out into your building, rats, rat infestations, other type of vermin infestations, like all, you know, mold, things like that, um, which, uh, you know, as when we reviewed the list, they all seemed to make sense. What we found after we settled on this idea that, okay, we want to find the buildings that have a s history of serious code violations is we did a bunch of work analyzing the data based on these property group numbers that have had, have had a serious code violation in the past. We wanted to cut out all the ones that only had one or, you know, showed up in the data very, very infrequently. And essentially we did a whole bunch of analysis in R that showed us that Buildings can sometimes, uh, the, the thing that matters essentially is years in which buildings are cited for serious code violations. Because every inspection could turn up like tons of them, but if it only happens once, then it's not a building with a chronic problem. So we really focused on, okay, are, is there some kind of natural way to distinguish between buildings that have, uh, you know, once got, had a big problem and, and some kind of critical mass of years in which uh, buildings rack up serious code violations that then they don't tend to get better. And we found that that cutoff point for us that made sense was, was four years. So once a building, this uh, graph here on the left, it shows what happens within a window of five years for uh, a building that has like this bottom line is like one year in which they were cited for a serious code violation. The next line is like two years, three years, et cetera. So, once a building has had four years uh, in which it's been cited for serious code violations, more than half of buildings like that end up having another serious violation in the next five years. So essentially there's, this is, you know, for people that do statistics and all this kind of work uh, in their daily life, this, this should, th the logic of this should make sense. There's no magical thing about four years necessarily. It's just a cutoff point that made sense to us. And on the right-hand side is a breakdown of how many of our 2,600 uh, buildings had like how many years of serious violations. So you can see that about half of, our, of this pool of buildings uh, had four or five years in which they were cited for serious violations. And then we had like eight buildings in the city that have basically been cited for serious violations every year going back to 2006. Um, so... You could, you could make different choices about how to cut off this data, but this is, this is the, the process that made sense to us and the kind of cutoff point that made sense to us. So now that we have that uh, data, then the next step for us was to try to figure out, okay, so where are these 2,600 buildings in the city of Chicago, right? And um, part of the question for us was, that, as we all know, because there's a history of racist policies and laws, the city is really segregated, right? Like Chicago is about a third Hispanic, a third white, a third black, and it's just uh, the concentrations of people continue to live in the sections of the city where there were racist policies and laws that kept them there, right? And so we did, we used census blocks, uh, block groups, because there's like, in the census are like the smallest, um, we, everyone is nodding, yes, you all know what that is. I don't need to explain it. Great. Um, <laughs> uh, and so we figure out that, yes, we, part of the question was like, can we say that they disproportionately impact black people? Yes, they are disproportionate. All of this built, the majority of the buildings are disproportionately in black communities, over 80% black. Um, then the next step was to try to think about also in terms of uh, economics and low income, right? Going back to that question that we had. Yes. One, just one quick question. I no doubt that it like, affects predominantly black neighborhoods most. Do you worry that there's some underrepresentation from Latino neighborhoods because even getting to a building code violation might include some kind of reporting and so it's not, a, it's not quite a 
fair sample of which buildings are being reported? That is, posts, yep, yeah. I got it. It's an excellent question. It's something that we thought about. The, the thing is that you cannot do data analysis on something that you don't have, right? Like, so the absence of it is definitely a problem, but like if people are not calling, yes. I mean, we thought about it too because of the way that the city, the other way to think about it, right, is like, yes, they, they were this a specific policy decisions that kept black communities segregated in specific areas of the city. And so they are majority black communities and they are majority white communities. It's not, it's it's hard to find a community that is like 80%, right? Like 80% Hispanic, there are not that many. Those, those communities tend to be more um, integrated, right? And so, yes. Um, well, the other thing I'll just add is that larger buildings have tend to have more profound histories of serious code violations. And these concentrations, like where these dots are concentrated, are also, is also reflective of where this kind of housing stock is in the city. So, you know, it's, the Latino community in the city is more concentrated in lower density neighborhoods compared to the black community. So that's a, it's, another, it's a, also a reflection of the housing stock. And this is the, the other thing that we wanted to point out is like, I mean, like the, the disproportionate representation of this, this is a problem that happens everywhere in the city, right? Like our, our analysis shows that there's at least three buildings in every single ward, but they're concentrated in those communities. And that raises a policy question. It's like, we as a society, do we want to live in a, in a city that continues to disproportionately put in the shoulders of black residents bad buildings, the, uh, the issues of ticketing, the huge amounts of policing, right? The lack of access to healthcare and healthy food, like all of it is concentrated in these same communities. And I think we, like it's not, it's important, it was important for us to keep reminding people that these communities are already having to deal with this burden. Okay, so um, the, the next step was the, coming back to the question of like, okay, well, what's happening with evictions in these buildings? So um, now we've identified a pool of buildings that have this history of serious problems. Um, and we turned to Cook County data on evictions that I had been uh, collecting from the uh, clerk of the circuit court for several years through data requests uh, made via the office of the chief judge. So there's not like a data portal where you can get bulk access to this court data, but court data is public and uh, it is possible to get like bulk records. So we had records on every single eviction case that was filed in Cook County going back to 2007. So once we had our pool of problematic buildings identified, we decided to look and see uh, are there evictions happening here? And we found that in uh, most of these buildings, in 65% of these buildings with these problematic histories, tenants were taken to eviction court in the same year that the building was cited for serious code violations. So uh, in order to tr triangulate this, um, we, oh, and the other thing that we noticed once we did this analysis is that buildings with, uh, longer histories of serious code violations actually had higher median eviction numbers than buildings with shorter histories of serious code violations. And this was significant because it's essentially something that like, it, it throws, it, it's, a, it's a finding that um, flies in the face of the common presumption that like shabbier buildings are more affordable places to live. Most eviction cases are initiated over unpaid rent. So what this uh, box and whisker plot indicated to us essentially was that like buildings that have more severe histories of, of serious problems aren't, we shouldn't presume that there are more affordable places to live because people tend to get taken to eviction court there more than at buildings that have, that have uh, a less prolonged history of these problems. So in order to connect the building code violation data and the eviction data, we had to deal with like extremely messy addresses that are present in the eviction um, data. So the city's building code violation data has this handy property group number. Uh, nothing like that exists in the eviction data. And if you, as you can see here in column L, this is, this is like a screenshot of um, what the uh, eviction data looks like with one row of information for every case. And this is already after it's been kind of significantly cleaned. But as you can see, the addresses um, sometimes have the presence of like rogue unit numbers, other addresses where people, were, these are addresses where uh, 
somebody's trying to evict somebody from this address. Like the landlord files, the plaintiff is the landlord. They file the case and they indicate what is the address from which they would like to remove the person. So uh, these addresses, you know, sometimes can have unit numbers. Other times they don't. There's a million different spellings for some of these streets. So we had to do um, a lot of uh, cleaning. We had to run things through Geocodio to uh, fix a persistent issue of incorrect zip codes being uh, connected to these addresses because the e-filing system the court uses is like if somebody writes in an address without a zip code, it'll populate it automatically with like a loop zip code. So just like there, there, were, there was a lot of cleaning involved in, in getting this into a usable format. But once we did, we were able to uh, connect this data with the building code data. And that's how we found the 1700 buildings. So then... And this this will make sense a little bit later, but then what what this is something that we didn't know when we started reporting, right? Remember what the original story was connecting building code violations to evictions data, and then you may be wondering, well, how did you end up with housing court data? Well, we it, initially at the very beginning of the project, we didn't even know that there was a housing court call. We knew about eviction calls but we didn't know about housing court calls. And so we at this point of the process, we had already started following tenants. Um, the city of Chicago has an ordinance that was passed in 1986 that allows tenants to withhold rent. And what we started learning was that the tenants who were withholding rent will often end up in eviction court, even when their landlords would also be taken by the city to housing court because of the severity of the code violation. So the, the most, the strongest tool in the city's toolbox to try to get a landlord to comply with the, um, with the code is to take them to court and then have a judge say, yes, you have to fix all these different things. So then we decided like, hmm, we wonder how many, can we quantify that? How many people are being taken to court at the same time that their landlords are being, are being taken to court by the city and are in housing court? So that led us into another rabbit hole to try to figure out like, oh, we have more addresses now that we need to clean out and try to figure out how do we match it to this data. And addresses are not as, they're just so such a nightmare to like clean it. <laughs> as, as you all know, Do you want to say about where we got um, this with, from Data Made? Yeah, so we got right. So we got this from the uh, Data Made. Data Made has been um, essentially sc scraping is the best way to say it. Scraping the data and has it um, has most of the docket information. So we don't get the information, the specific information about the cases, but we get like the 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 broad kind of information about when the case was filed, what kind of case it was, and a little bit of information about the cases, anything that you will see in a docket essentially. And so with DataMate actually, who was helping us do this analysis, um, Forrest was helping us do this analysis. He, was, he helped us also clean up the addresses so that we can match them. And so that's when we did some more R magic and we figured out that there were, we were doing the data analysis with buildings, right? So we found 328 buildings in which there was a eviction uh, case and a um, housing case file in the same year. And that was really significant because it allowed us for the first time to quantify or to get a sense of the problem. So did you suspect that they were related, like the same tenant that was being evicted, or, or could you not determine that? We couldn't determine whether it was the same tenant because in it was essentially impossible to know which unit, whether there was like, then you have to, if you, in order to do that kind of analysis, you have to know whether the inspector went to that specific unit, whether the eviction was in that very same unit and whether the housing court cases or the allegations in the housing court had to do with that unit. So we did it by building because when you go back and look at the like serious code violations, the majority of the serious code violation are issues that would impact the, the, the entire building, not a specific units. Um, and so we did it by buildings because that's what we were analyzing. But if you want to see it in terms of cases, we found at least 903 eviction cases that were filed in the same year that a housing case was filed. And then the other thing that really caught our, our attention was like we wanted to know how we're uh, tenants treated in eviction court versus how landlords were treated in housing court. And in order for us to, to, to know that or to try to do that analysis, we, we wanted to know like how long does a case, does it take for a case to close? And so the analysis that you see on the screen is like we figure out that it takes about 10 times as long for a housing case to close. So a tenant will get evicted 
essentially the median was about a month. In a housing case, it was 300 and I think it was 309 days. Yes. Um, so it takes a lot longer. And with something that we observe when we were observing housing court calls, right, that the, the landlord will get opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to kind of fix the building. Whereas in eviction court, we will know that eviction court is set up for the tenant to get evicted as quickly as possible. Things have slowed down since the pandemic and now it's taking a little longer for tenants to get evicted, but the analysis is kind of holds. About 60% of the cases, the eviction cases filed in Cook County uh, in the Chicago end with an eviction order against a tenant. But that uh, lots of times, even if the case is dismissed and on paper there's no eviction order, the reason that happens is because the tenant and landlord have come to an agreement that the tenant will move out. So it's, uh, you know, th that 60% figure kind of undersells how much displacement is happening um, in the context of these uh, eviction cases. One of the things that we did, and this maybe gets a little bit uh, to the question that was just asked, is we were seeing anecdotally that there were people who uh, were, whose landlords were being prosecuted by the city in housing court, who then were facing uh, retaliation from landlords for agitating for them to fix their buildings and were getting taken to eviction court at the same time as the landlord was still tied up in housing court over all these code violations. And in a way that was like, this is kind of how we came to the, to the heart and the, and the core of the project is we started learning about these different tenant groups who were trying to organize, they were forming unions, they were in some cases uh, trying to do rent strikes um, and utilize their, their right to withhold rent in order to pressure their landlords to improve conditions in the buildings. Um, some of them were actively trying to get the city on their landlords uh, kind of radar. I mean, the, trying to get their landlords on the city's la radar. And in, in one case, uh, tenants actually banded together to, um, to, to not only get the city to prosecute the landlord for the building code violations, but also to, to sue the landlord in like a class action lawsuit. So we were hearing about um, different groups of tenants around town trying to leverage the legal mechanisms available to them to, to get their landlords to fix buildings and to prevent their own displacement. Um, and uh, essentially, once we combined all this data work with these uh, the extended period of court observations and following tenant stories, what we found was kind of this uh, bifurcated justice system that exists when it comes to enforcing the two sides of a contract that's at the heart of the landlord-tenant relationship. Essentially, uh, whether you have a formal lease or not, what the landlord-tenant relationship is, is you agree to pay rent and I agree to provide you habitable housing. This has been the law in Illinois since the 1970s, that when you enter into a lease agreement with a tenant, you as the landlord uh, are, are providing what's called an implied warranty of habitability, meaning that like your this thing that this person is renting is like a housing that meets minimum standards. So when it came to landlords saying that the tenant didn't hold up their end of the bargain and they're not paying the rent, the legal system functions quite efficiently to address uh, that side of the contract rupture, so to speak. However, on the other side of the coin, when the tenants are like, well, this housing is inhabitable. Like we're not, you know, this, this, this part of the, this end of the bargain is not being held up. The legal system, you know, is not functioning in an efficient way to, um, to, to get the housing fixed and to, to give uh, redress to the tenants. And so on the, on, the, on the screen here, you see the images of some of the tenants whose stories we followed, and we'll tell you a little bit more about them. Yep. Oh, go ahead. Um, so are you saying that the majority of this correlation has to do with um, tenants viewing like rent withholding? Well, we don't really know how many tenants withhold rent because uh, there's no like data source for this um, from, I mean, when we watch eviction court, sometimes people will say like, 
well, because the judges will ask, like, are you paying the rent or not? Did you pay the rent or not? And they don't want to know the reasons for why. But sometimes tenants will say, like, well, yeah, I didn't pay the rent, but it's because I haven't had a running water for X number of months or whatever. Um, we hear this kind of thing. We encountered this with the tenants whose stories we followed. But there's no, we, there's no way for, to know, like, how many people are trying to, like, exercise their right to withhold the rent. Most people do it informally. There's technically an extremely complicated legal process, like technical process for doing it correctly, which Alejandro will say more about. But most people don't do it like by the letter of how you're supposed to. Um, they just kind of like, well, the heat is not working. I'm not paying the rent this month. And that opens them up to, uh, you know, being taken to, to eviction court. Uh, is there a, did you do any kind of analysis on the breakdown between these, um, I guess, chronically, um, chronically, um, by these buildings that are in chronic violations, um, did you any kind of breakdown on how many are market rate versus how many are affordable? So, I mean, the affordability is such an interesting question because like, like, Technically, some of these buildings are, uh, there was one specific building that we follow that was so completely subsidized. So it's called project-based voucher. So it's completely subsidized by HUD. Uh, so technically the rents are affordable, but I mean, they're still, you know, it's the federal government is paying thousands of dollars a month to house people there. Um, the, I think the majority of them were in what is known as uh, naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, what we know from tenants, the tenants that we follow and the tenants that we spoke with is that the rents continue to increase in Chicago to a point that is becoming really expensive uh, or really difficult for people to continue to pay. And we see that we actually, you know, you can see kind of the relationship of like how expensive the rents are becoming when you're seeing the increased number of evictions, especially in those buildings, right? Again, evictions is a measure of affordability. So the fact that people are getting evicted, it could be two things, right? One, it could be like they're actually withholding their rent because of the condition but it also means that tenants, and it's true, a lot of the times tenants cannot afford to keep up with that kind of rent. This actually gets at what, what this slide is about, which is like, it's once we got, once we like kind of like started to get a few specific buildings and cases on our radar, we found like, how difficult it is to say something about like, what are these buildings? Who owns them? What else do they own? So one of the landlords that we follow, and we wanted to know what are the kind of portfolios that these landlords had. Like, was it one building? Did they own multiple buildings? And in some cases, it took two federal investigations to try to figure out who the landlords were and how many buildings did they own. In this particular case, because it was sort of a newer lander in the city, I was able to go through the Secretary of State and um, most of the buildings in Chicago are owned through something called a limited liability company. And so when landlords um, create this limited liability company, oftentimes they create it under the address of the building. And so then once you have an address, then you, you can go to the secretary of the state, kind of type the address down and tr try to figure out whether or not you can connect it to the lender. And they are... Annual, annual reports that I require that I file with the Secretary of State that gives you a little bit more information about who the managers are. Um, in this particular case, we were able to connect it all back to like, we were able to figure out who the humans were behind all of the LLCs and figure out that it was a, essentially like a family owning these buildings and how an approximation of how many buildings they own in the city. It's nearly impossible to know ex whether we got them all or we got the majority of them because if we don't know the LLC name, then it would be impossible for us to go back and do this kind of work. Them, right? right, so so we did a mix of like news reporting, right? Like so anytime that we, you know, we, we figure out whether or not other people have reported of them. And then there is this really cool website called This Guys. I don't know if anyone has heard of it. No? Uh, Anthony well, Moser? No? Yeah. If you so, guys haven't seen these guys, you should. <laughs> Anthony Moser, who's amazing, he created this ability to um, search the Secretary of the State. Like, if you are familiar with the Secretary of State website, it's it's actually kind of you know funky. You can only search very limited amounts of information, but with these guys, you can search like massively and create more connections. You can find more connections within the data. So if you have a name, it will find all the companies that are affiliated with that name. And so my job was to try to figure out whether or not I can actually get the records to prove that it was the right connection, that it wasn't just a computer making a connection, but it was the actual connection. It's D-E-S-E-G-U-Y-E-S. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, and you can also, it's similarly, like if you know, like we knew an, an address affiliated with these people's companies. So we like, we were able to search like what else is registered at this address. Um, so, and that, that, so that map was actually like where all these, these particular people's buildings are. And it was like around 20 buildings that they own, which is like a fairly small operation. Um, the second story in the series is focused on this gentleman, Gary Carlson, who's a landlord up in Albany Park. This guy owns like 84 buildings. And at a certain point, the city of Chicago had most of his buildings in housing court, uh, more than 70 of them. And uh, the, the it would be if this this guy is like really old school, like he runs his business completely analog. This binder in his hands is like he has a physical binder with all the information on every one of the buildings he owns and he keeps everything on paper and he he has like basic Excel spreadsheets that he uses in his business. But essentially, like he doesn't use a ton of shell LLCs to hide his property ownership. Most of his buildings are owned by, in his own name. They're all registered in the same address. He has like one LLC that is the legal owner of some of his more recent properties. But he basically told me like his lawyer told him to do it and he really hates doing it and he, wish he wishes he didn't have to. But this kind of landlord is like a dying breed. Like he's just, he's just a very, he has a very old school way of doing things. He himself gave me a list of all of his buildings, which you see an example of on the right. This is how he has this. This is how he keeps this information. So the city also, I think, was able to file its cases against him partially because they got a similar list. He's very open about what he owns. Um, and if this if this particular landlord was taking more steps to to kind of insulate himself from legal liability in the way that contemporary landlords do, like we would not have been able to track down all 84 of his buildings. So this is an example of what companies are looking more and more today. Um, th this is the example where it took two federal investigations to get to the heart of who was owning the company. So we started with Ellis Lakeview as the apartment building that we were kind of researching. And, you know, there's like Block Club Chicago has actually done an amazing job uh, writing about Ellis Lakeview apartments and they had identify a couple of the owners, but it was the federal investigators who actually discover like this big web, actually some of the the uh, people who are tied to the ownership of Ellis Lakeview are under federal investigation related, like different issues that they were essentially for uh, fra defrauding a bank. Um, what's interesting about it is that this is one web that we could kind of identify, but they were connected to this other web that happened earlier. I don't know if you all are familiar with the Better Housing Foundation, but that was another um, nonprofit that was created to own a number of properties in Chicago. It filed for bankruptcy. Um, what was really interesting to us is to see some of the same names that were in the board of that foundation be listed again as members of the organization that eventually also failed with the ownership of Ellis Lakeview. And the, the crazy thing, too, is that this uh, Better Housing Foundation was like a massive scandal in, in the city, and there were a ton of housing court cases pro where the city was prosecuting uh, people over the state of these buildings. And later on, this Ellis Lakeview building also became the subject of a big housing court case that the city was very focused on. But like people in the city who were working these cases didn't know that there had been connections between people related to the Better Housing Foundation and, and Ellis Lakeview. Ultimately, what we found is that there, is, there's the, there are these kind of lapses in the uh, building code enforcement process that make it so that if you really want to get away with keeping a building in bad condition, you can do that. Uh, you can hide your ownership. You can get away with, uh, with not being on the city's radar for a very long time. Um, and Essentially, this uh, w when it's working at its best, when the, the building code enforcement process is at its toughest, um, the, ultimately, all the city can legally do is like vacate a building. Like a judge can order a building to be vacated because it's so unsafe. If a landlord doesn't want to fix things, they can't be forced to. Um, and so when buildings get so bad that they have to be vacated, people end up on the street. On the other hand, uh, when, you know, there's, there's lax code enforcement and landlords aren't taken to task, the conditions in these buildings are also leading to people getting displaced and ending up on the street, either because they try to withhold rent and kind of do their own rent strike and they end up getting evicted over that, 
or because it's just not habitable and people end up being displaced because because they 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 can't continue to remain in um in these uh in these housing conditions so uh, these are just uh, folks who, like on the left is a gentleman who ended up uh, ha being displaced from his home of 25 years uh, because it was a building that was bought by some investors in New York and they just ran it into the ground. And uh, uh, I mean, their side of the story was that there were issues in the building they didn't anticipate, but essentially the things got so bad that the city said, we need to clear this building of residence. The company also agreed that that was a good idea, and Mr. London uh, ended up having to scramble to find a new place to live, and he still hasn't found permanent housing. And the folks on the right are a family that dealt with like lack of heat in their building for three winters in a row, and pest infestations, and all kinds of other issues. And at some point, uh, yeah, there was they decided to withhold rent as well, and uh, you know were threatened with eviction, and ultimately they were not evicted because they agreed to leave. And they were displaced essentially out of out of a building that uh, had all kinds of code violations. So yeah, this is this is essentially a little bit more information on on housing court and how the investigation essentially found that um, part of their reason for a limited effectiveness of the housing court enforcement process has to do with the way that housing court is run by the supervising judge and the other judges assigning to that assigned to that division of a court. Um, so it ended up being much more of an injustice to watch story than we initially anticipated um, uh, and uh, just underscored the importance of, of paying attention to who our elected judges are. The final story in the piece is about solutions, right? Like we wanted to know what were the sort of solutions on the table. And there's a number of proposals that have come to the table here in Chicago. Well, the majority of them are being installed, but stall, are stalled right now. But um, they will create essentially, in some cases, a, a registry of landlords. In other cases, um, pre ante or like regular inspections of apartment buildings as opposed to having to call 311 and inspect them only when there is a problem. Um, there's obviously other ideas that are, are happening around the country. One of the things that um, housing organizations talk told us again and again, it's like what really needs to happen is a shift in the way that we think about housing. What if housing was a human right? What if it was above the rights of a landlord to own property? And then I'll leave you with this final thought from one of the organizers. Um, oftentimes we hear that it is the tenants. And then I think the narrative, the historical narrative about people who live in this kind of housing is that they are the problem and that they are creating uh, the, the issues in the buildings are their fault. Uh, but this organizer said the best. Tenants don't control the water pressure. They don't control the boilers. They don't have nothing to do with the elevator or whether or not it works because those are systemic problems with the building. And that is it. I think we have, still have time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you all so much for this work. Super powerful, also really technically interesting. You mentioned that, uh, Maya, that one of the most common ways that a case that moves to housing court against a landlord ends is that the building is vacated. Like that's one of the few tools that the city has. How does that relate to like receivership? I've heard that's another, com what, are the, what are the tools that the city has? This is a great question. So actually we cannot say that it's a common way the housing court case ended. The most common way that housing court cases end is that they're dismissed because the building has been brought into compliance or substantial compliance. Everybody involved in the housing court process, whether it's the attorneys from the city law department division that prosecute these cases, or even the judges who themselves told us about this, the, the goal of housing court is to get the landlord, to get the building owner in compliance, uh, to get them to fix the problem, and the goal is not to find them. The goal is not to punish them. I mean, essentially, after a while, I began thinking about it as like this is a restorative justice system for property owners. This is a this is like what people in the criminal justice space dream about criminal justice being. Like it's like we you that you there's this thing you messed up, but like we're going to bring you in here and help you like get your act together, and then like. We're not here to punish you or fine you, just like fix your building and we'll give you as much time as you need to do that. Just show us that you're making efforts. Um, so uh, because of how messy the dockets are, we really couldn't um, do an analysis that, w that we were comfortable with about the frequency with which these kinds of orders to clear buildings are issued. But the judges told us that this is like, 
basically other than demolition, it's like the worst scenario because it leads to people being displaced. It, it leads to a loss of housing units. They don't like to do it. But the receivership question is very interesting because that is one of the tools that exists in housing court. Um, judges can appoint essentially third party companies or third party nonprofits that become responsible for fixing the issues. They can be limited receivers that are appointed for like something really specific, like you need to fix like the porch on this building, or they can be receivers that are appointed to do everything, like to collect rents, to, to really run the, the entire business of the building. Um, and currently, uh, we talked to many sources who spoke to us in, in like confidentially about how there is a problem right now with judges in a housing court not wanting to appoint receivers. The, the, the supervising judge, Leonard Murray, this is, this is, this is him in this illustration, um, he basically told us in an interview that he, you know, he doesn't take this lightly and he sees this as fee shifting and he's suspicious of receivers as like a profit motivated kind of uh, um, uh, operators, um, but there's really only three main receivers in the city, and two of them are nonprofits. And from everything we gathered, um, it, it's a very difficult time right now with with receiverships. Just real quick, um, I want to know: when you're speaking about the violations against buildings, like if someone calls uh, DOB on the uh, owners. Are all those uh, violations listed on the website or online? And one last uh, scenario, what if um, a tenant uh, actually reads their lease very carefully and find out that the landlord uh, has not been, you know, holding up to agreements within that contract, that lease, and literally ask the landlord questions about it? I'm giving you a real life scenario. And, and that and that landlord refuses to even offer the uh, or renew that tenant's lease because they feel like either you just signed the lease or not. That's a real life situation I know of. To, to your first question, yes, it is in the um, uh, Chicago has a data portal, and it uh, we can put that in the chat as well or in the Slack channel. Uh, but yes, it's it's in the the city's data portal, and you can literally put it, plug in an address, and it will give you the uh, violations that are for that specific address. For the second question, I'll warn you and say that we're not legal experts. So uh, any any time that you have a contract, it's a lease is a contract between a landlord and a tenant, and so the best advice that we can give any tenant is that they, they should definitely contact an attorney um, to help them with that legal, because it's a legal contract with that legal problem. Um, unfortunately, if the landlord is not following up on their side of the bargain and the landlord does not want to follow up on their side of the bargain, the only recourse for the tenant is to essentially sue, right? I mean, so that's how you would um, kind of litigate that dis that dispute and have the judge force, essentially hope that the judge will force the landlord to make good on their side of the bargain. Yeah, I mean, this kind of thing too, about, I mean, essentially the situation you're describing it sounds a little bit like, oh, you're like asking too many questions. I don't want you to be a tenant anymore. Like th this, we saw this thing happening and there's really nothing, there's no just cause for eviction in Chicago. Landlords don't have to have a reason to file an eviction case or to non -renew, not renew someone's lease. I mean, now there's like the fair notice ordinance created these requirements for how much notice they have to give people depending on how long they've been living there. But essentially, yeah, like there, you know, there's no, there's no legal protection. Nobody can force a landlord to continue renting to someone if they don't want to because that person is asking too many questions. Um, and uh, just an additional point about the, you, you can look up the building, the, the, the building code violations that have been you know, documented at whatever building might interest you if there have been documented code violations. But you can also look up the city's, one of the things in the Socrata data portal set that the city has is also the, the 311 call data. So you can also look up to see like what kind of complaints came in. Cause there's like 40,000 311 calls every month and like maybe 15,000 inspections that result in violations being documented. So people call in with all kinds of complaints and you can have a, a sense of that from the portal. So you said that there was an official process by the city for rent withholding. And you said that the reason why, or that it's a complicated process. Why is that? Um, can you explain that a little bit further? Yeah. So 
we'll take it back to the 1980s, actually in the 1970s. So um, it wasn't until the 1970s that uh, tenants had something called habit of the warranty of habitability. Essentially, the Illinois Supreme Court ruled that yes, the, the, there is a contract between a landlord and a tenant and that the tenant has certain obligations, but the landlord also has certain obligations. And among those obligations is to keep the building in um, up to the code, is the, the minimum safety standards that the code provides. Uh, following that Supreme Court the, a ruling, there were a number of pushes to try to get the city to have its own ordinance sort of protecting the lease between the landlord of the tenant, and that became the Chicago Landlord Tenant Ordinance that was passed in 1986. The creators of that ordinance wanted to have a strong, wanted to first of all protect the tenant, the lease itself, to make sure that there weren't additional things in the lease that were like really bad for the tenants. For instance, at one point, like the tenant could take the the landlord could take the tenant to court and tell the judge, hey, the tenant owes me this amount of money and I, I want to withhold it from their wages. And the judge will say like, okay, because the tenant signed this portion of the lease that had that in there. And so all of a sudden you look at your paycheck and your paycheck is missing money and it's because your landlord is taking your money and you didn't even know. And so the original writers of the ordinance wanted to regulate that and for that not to happen and uh, created this ordinance. And that was like the main point, but they also wanted to have additional protections for tenants, including the ability of tenants to do something to try to force the landlord to withhold rent. They, the initial, the iteration of the ordinance, this protection was stronger, but it went through several layers of, you know, conversations with multiple other men who were not uh, happy with the ordinance. It took a very long time for it to pass. And when it finally passed, the, the withholding part of it was still there. Like you could withhold rent to be able to force the lender to fix things, but it got more and more complicated as time went on. So essentially, if you wanted to withhold rent, you have to send a letter 14 days before you even start withholding rent, give your lender a chance to actually fix the issues. And it goes on and on and on. Even if you, like, it's so specific as to like, you have to send that letter to the specific address that is listed on the lease. So if you email it to your landlord, you didn't give them, you, you, the landlord could argue in court that you didn't give the landlord proper notice and therefore you withhold, you withheld illegally. And this is why like housing organizers will say like, they don't recommend that tenants withhold rent anymore because they don't feel that they're protected or as protected as the ordinance seems to make it, makes it seem. Yeah, and it's, uh, there's also like, you can't just withhold the entire rent. Like there's like a way that you have to calculate how much the apartment has lost value as a result of this or that condition problem. And what we saw, I mean, is that like, even when people are working with lawyers to properly do all this, it still doesn't protect them like from retaliatory eviction filings, from non-renewals of leases. Um, it just, yeah, we, didn't, we did not see like happy endings to rent withholding stories. And that's the other part of it because there is no, like essentially your landlord can evict you for any reason or for no reason at all. Say that the landlord say, says to the judge, well, I'm not retaliating against them. I just really want to evict them. I mean, the landlord can really do that. And what we know from like eviction filings is like they really hurt the tenant's chance to find another apartment. So the tenant tries to do everything they can to avoid getting evicted. Thank you very much for a really great presentation. I'm going to check out your articles. Um, yeah, I guess what, what's foremost in my mind is that first chart you have of, of you know, the, the uh, yes, there with the, and the extreme uh, geographical clustering of, of the high violation housing. And I feel like that is just such a powerful picture. So I have, I have two comments about just trying to you know, understand how, um, how, how to understand that uh, chart. And I, first I might say that I live in Rogers Park in that, in that high, highlight area in the Northeast there. <laughs> I live in an apartment that I, I feel is very poorly maintained. But um, what I'm wondering is like, to what degree is, is this picture um, explainable by, by simple things, like, first of all, uh, that's one thing, like, you know, is, is this kind of a picture of where 
uh, you know, low income apartment buildings are located or something like that. Is it you know, that kind of simplicity? And the other thing is, you know, to what degree is that picture dependent on the specific, you know, formula you, you uh, came up with for identifying this housing? And hopefully, you know, it doesn't change too much if you change you know, the, the definitions a little bit. I, I think this is a really very powerful picture that deserves to be widely seen. So, I mean, first and foremost, it's a picture of where there is housing density and where there's, there's density of multi-unit buildings. Because again, those are the kind of buildings that tend to have more frequent serious code violations. Uh, it's also a picture of where, I mean, it, this cutoff, like if we had done, if we had just, so the, if you look at the graph on the right, um, if, if let's say we set aside buildings that have only four years in which they've been cited for serious violations and or five years. Oh, and by the way, when when we, our criteria was like, you had to have been cited in four separate years, and the last time you were cited had to have been within the last three years. So this isn't for buildings that have had four years of serious violations from 2007 to 2011. This is, this is something that there, there, there's been more recent serious violations. But even if you cut off the like four years and five years, and let's start, let's say you started with six, or even if you focused on like 10 plus years, the you would still see a concentration in in areas that have older larger buildings uh which are also areas that not just rogers park but i mean this is south, this is south shore this is the west side where there are a lot of larger apartment buildings um it's chatham but the other thing i'll say is that like this doesn't necessarily tell you that like right now, each one of these buildings is in terrible condition. Uh, I also live in Rogers Park and as we were doing this work, I like was constantly scanning around for these buildings in, in my corner of the neighborhood. And sometimes I was surprised to see that like one of the buildings on our list is this building that I know and it doesn't seem so bad. Another one of these buildings is a building where my friend lives and it took them three months to get the landlord to give them a toilet that, you know, because when their toilet wasn't working. And other buildings are like in truly deplorable condition that didn't show up at all because, well, they haven't been cited for serious code violations in four, you know, four or more years. So it's, it's a rough way to think about the persistence of this problem. And we were actually very much wanting to discuss this with the city. Like we wanted these kinds of questions. We wanted this kind of like dialogue about like, well, like, is this like a good criteria to use to assess this problem? But we have to have some criteria because there are buildings that are in persistently terrible conditions. Um, no one at the city wanted to talk to us about this. I would tell that like it's also like you know you think about where the data is come. data is never perfect like right? where is the data coming from the the origin of the data is a three one one call like the first step in the process is someone calling to complain about a problem then when someone calls and complain about the problem then the city sends an inspector and then the inspector writes a report about what they saw in that building this is the data of what the inspector saw in that building at that particular time um, that they decided to document. Right, that they decided to document, correct. And so they documented it, they put it on the portal, we downloaded it from the portal, we analyzed the data. So it is, it is the data that we have. It is. It doesn't account for every single building that has a problem, right? It accounts for the buildings that we know where there is a problem. Could there be more? Yes, we are pretty sure that there are more buildings. These are the ones that we can count. The other point that I make is like, we as tenants have been taught that we have to live under certain conditions, right? You want to have a roof over your head. Some of the tenants that we spoke with, they, especially at the Gary Carlson apartments, they told us like, oh yeah, this is bad, but you should have seen the last apartment where I came from, right? So it's like the other thing that we were, we thought a lot about is the idea of like landlords milking, milking these properties, right? This is the term that experts have come up with, right? Like that they, especially nowadays, and we're seeing that right now, I mean, it was crazy to us to see, to see it li like live happening where investors will come in, super and buy properties and they're buying them at like prices that we thought were 
really high for the conditions of the buildings, right? A million, two million dollars for some of these buildings. The per unit cost of these buildings was really high. And how is it possible that these landlords could continue to scoop up these buildings at this really high mortgages and continue to keep them occupied? Well, they're not fixing anything, right? They're trying to squeeze as much rental money as they can. And so what we know from these buildings is because of the age of the building, what we're seeing is a lot of deferred maintenance, right? So they're kind of sort of like hovering and doing sort of okay. And it takes one bad lander to not do the right thing and not to continue to replace the toilets or replace the issues or continue to fix the leaks. And then things go to hell very quickly. And that's what we saw with the uh, Mr. London's buildings, right? He had been sort of like helping patched this building up for like the more than 20 years that he lived there. As soon as he was no longer like maintaining the building, it just deteriorated very quickly. Uh, we have a couple questions from the live stream. Uh, first, um, we have someone that's uh, interested in your contact information. Uh, in justicewatch.org, uh, you can find our staff page there under about and our emails are there. Great. Um, and the other question, uh, was there a clear or noticeable difference in how small landlords and large landlords are treated in housing court? The entire housing court system is built around the assumption that the landlord standing in that courtroom is a small mom and pop landlord. The entire system is created to work with that kind of landlord. So we, there are tons of small property owners, owner occupants, people who are aging, who own aging properties, who are having all kinds of issues, who don't have the money to fix things, that wind up in housing court. And while it is quite onerous for them to be dealing with this process, and it's expensive, and it's, and, and it's scary and a hassle, uh, th this is, again, not a process that's designed to punish those folks. Uh, but the same yardstick and the same kind of process tends to be applied to landlords who have the capacity to fix things, who have, who are well capitalized. Um, I mean, sometimes there's like kind of less patience with them, like, you know, the city's lawyers or building inspectors or the judges will express uh, you know, dissatisfaction at the speed with which things are going, at the speed with which they're fixing or not fixing things. But still, like, these cases take a really long time and there's no, we've never, we never saw really a stick deployed other than, like, in the worst case scenario, the building is shut down. But it's, um, yeah, I mean, it, the, much of what's happening seems to be calibrated to, like, how do we make sure that the city isn't coming down too hard on small struggling property owners and just doesn't account for the fact that there are ba legit bad actors. There are, there are property owners that are milking and everyone acknowledges that those entities exist, but they, what we didn't hear is like a kind of presumption that that's the default type of entity that they're dealing with. And, we, and we, we don't have the data to say that if that's a default or not, but it's just like everyone seems to recognize this is a problem, that we have like bad actors in the system, but it's like, well, we live under capitalism and the law has to protect property owners and we, that's just like the cost of this. It's just that like sometimes bad actors get away with really persistently bad landlording practices. One of the solutions that I saw that you had on the last slide was um, in reference to the land value tax currently are going to be considered um, in November by Detroit. Uh, I just recently learned about this policy. I'm surprised it um, it has bipartisan support. It's supposed to save money for, for like homeowners in their taxes and also disincentivize just holding onto abandoned land and empty, uh, uh, empty land and abandoned property. If it passes in Detroit, does that make it more promising for a city like Chicago? Is that something that um, you all are watching at all? I'm just kind of curious about it. Yeah, it's a very interesting um, revival of Georgia's ideas by uh, the mayor over there didn't seem to know anything about Henry George or these are, or this set of ideas, but like, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a very interesting thing. And um, given its bipartisan support and the fact that this mayor is not, this isn't like some kind of like lefty DSA type of politician, um, 
I do think that it's going to, I mean, there was like a huge New York Times write up about this whole thing. And it, it, yeah, I, it'll, I, I definitely think it would be, it would like make some waves. Um, uh, I had also not heard about this until like we were in the course of reporting this, but it's, it's a very, it's, yeah, it's a very interesting thing. Um, and definitely we're very curious to see what'll happen. I mean, the the last point I make is like anything that includes the word taxes in this day and age, especially in Chicago, it's it's a big it's a big issue. Um, I don't know. The truth is that the city, it's you know, at the size of the city, the amount of money that we spend. I mean, experts have said this: like we're not gener generating as much revenue as the city needs to be able to maintain itself and maintain all of the services and uh, to really be able to provide for all the citizens who live here. And yet we continue to have an adverse reaction to taxes. Um, so it would be really interesting to see what happens for sure. Cool. Well, thank you to our presenters. Thank you to everyone for the great questions. Give them another hand. Thank you so much.